Story of an up-and-coming athlete with an outstanding beginning in a grueling sport. The athlete is Beth Newell. She's a 13-year-old eighth grader from Edwardsville, and in two years, Beth has taken quite well to gymnastics, and the sport has taken quite well to her. She's been involved with lessons at the YWCA for two years, and in one year of competition, Beth has won first place in one or more events in every sanctioned competition she's entered. Beth Newell, you're pretty good at this. How'd you get interested in gymnastics? I was watching the Olympics on TV. Who was your favorite? I don't know. <laughs> and what would you like to do in gymnastics? You've been at it now for a couple of years and you've been pretty successful. How far would you like to go? Well, I don't know. I just want to be the best I could be. What do you still have to work on in order to really make a big improvement in gymnastics and really get better? Well, your strength and your confidence in yourself. What do you do to keep your confidence? I know that's very important for gymnasts. What do you do to keep your confidence up? Well, you have to, like, um, know what the next move is going to be. And what about when you're, say, when you're not working out? Is there something that you do, some way that you think to keep your confidence up about yourself and about what you're doing? Well, I just think the routine over my mind, and then I, when I get on the floor, I know what I'm going to do. You do it a bunch of, bunch of times? Yeah, I practice a lot. And then you do it in your head when you're not on the floor? Yes. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. <laughs> Beth started with John Hudock at the YWCA. He's watched her development very closely. She practices at least two hours a day, at least five days a week. At the meets she enters, she follows a national gymnastics format. She's on course to be as good nationally a prominent gymnast as her interest and her talent will let her be. We wish her luck. Gymnastics is a lot of work. Kevin Lynn reporting for Eyewitness Sports. When you're talking about top college prospects in basketball, in Scranton you need look no further than prep high school and string bean junior Billy Besswar. Billy's come from the right family for basketball. Dad Bob is the highly successful coach at the University of Scranton. Billy's physical picture is good news for basketball, six feet five inches. And while he's not fully developed, he has plenty of time. Remember, he's only a junior. His statistics might be the most impressive thing of all. A lovely outside jumper and good inside position basketball give Bill a more than 30-point game average for the first four games of the year. That's with shooting at better than 50% from the field, at better than 90% from the foul line, and it includes 12 rebounds and a couple of assists and steals a game. Billy Bessoir, worth the price of a ticket anytime at Scranton Prep. In the fall, you can find her running along the dike in Kirby Park, running for fun and running for her team, the defending district cross-country champions. In the winter, you can find her flying up and down the court, number 30 she is, leading the fast break for the defending district basketball champions. Her name is Deanna Sabaleski. She's an outstanding athlete on two of the outstanding girls teams in northeastern Pennsylvania. In the fall, Deanna runs cross-country for the Wyoming Valley West High School girls team, a team which has won the district cross-country title the last three years. On that team, Deanna only runs second, second to state third place finisher Cheryl Wallace, but Deanna also finished third in the district, which means she's third in the area in girls cross-country for schools her size. When basketball season comes around, though, Deanna really shines. Through this last Thursday, the Valley West girls were 8-0 on the year, and number 30 was leading the team in steals with four, assists with six, rebounds with 13 a game, and scoring at over 21 points a contest. Deanna says she might go to college for cross country, or maybe for basketball. But she says there's still lots of time to decide about that. By the way, there's still plenty of time to watch her do her thing for Wyoming Valley West. Deanna Sabaleski, Kevin Lynn reporting for Eyewitness News. On Wednesday afternoons, it's bowling at Chaco's East for the Wyoming Valley Senior Citizens League. The action proves again that activity in sports is limited to the young, at heart maybe. 90 bowlers ranging in age from 55 to 85 make up the 18 teams in the league, believed to be the biggest such league in the state. Each year the league sends members to the Pennsylvania Senior Citizens Tournament and this past October brought back over $600 in winnings. The two big tournament winners who received trophies today were George Billick of Old Forge who won the Class B singles and all events titles with a single score of 647 and Harry Zoller of Ashley who won in the younger Class C events with a single score of 669. Then the two went on to double up and win the doubles title. Today was the league's Christmas party with lots of eats and drinks for everyone and there's still room for more members according to league president Andy Jefferson. 
As for the ladies, there isn't a league yet, but take heart because the guys are having a great time. From Wilkesbury, Mark Albrecht for Eyewitness Sports. One of the reasons Bishop Hoban High School has the top record for big schools in this area is the work of number 32, or number 33, Bill Thunder Thornton. Bill's a senior and a three-year starter for the Argents, an all-scholastic from last season in the Wyoming Valley Basketball Conference. He is one of the very best pure shooters around. Over three years, Bill's averaged 21 points a game, over 24 points per game this season, and most of that comes on the outside gun. Bill needs only a moment to get open. At six feet tall, he has a very quick release. It allows him to shoot and score over the top of taller defenders. He helps out in the other departments, too. Six rebounds and four assists a game. And according to Coach Chet Hines, Bill's more than just a co-captain. He's a real team leader, a very intense competitor, and very coachable. Coach Hines says Bill needs to work on speed and quickness, but even so, there are lots of colleges looking at number 32. Bill will only say at this point that he wants a good education. But if you want a good show, this winner, check out Bishop Hoban High School and Bill Thunder Thornton. Kevin Lynn reporting for Eyewitness Sports. How about this one, sports fans? A five foot seven inch football wide receiver chosen all conference on offense and defense, a receiver who didn't even play football as a sophomore. A peanut sized guard on the basketball team, a three year starter at two different schools who's averaged 12 points a game the last two years. You're talking about the same man, talking about number four in football, number 11 in basketball, GAR's gritty Tommy Dewar. Tom's 5'7". He promises he is, even in his stocking feet. But Mr. D is one athlete who convinces you that it's the size of your heart that counts the most. When GAR was in trouble, they went to number four at the end of the game. This touchdown catch against Dunmore tied the game. The Grenadiers won in overtime. Guess who made another great fourth down catch to move the ball to the five yard line? In all, Tommy Dewar scored five touchdowns this year, caught right around 30 passes, gained right around 300 yards. It was good enough to be chosen all conference as a wide receiver, and as a defensive back, depending on the all-star team you like. Not bad for a little kid. Speaking of which, Tom Dewar casts a long shadow on the basketball court, too. Tommy started as a sophomore for Bishop Hoban, and the last two years he started at GAR. He's averaged 12 points and six bruised bones a game. Tom doesn't seem to notice. He likes to get involved, literally. Most of the time, he passes off to set up his teammates. He has a knack for finding the open man, but he can hit the drive and the long shot, whatever the team needs. Tommy says he's liked to play sports in college, maybe at Lycoming or at Bloomsburg, or maybe even the University of Delaware. No matter where he goes, up to this point, Tom Dewar is one of those athletes about whom you can say and be right. He gives 100%. Tom Dewar. Green-suited Bishop Hoban was at Kistler School today in a meet with Coughlin. Going into the meet, Coughlin was 0-4 on the year, Hoban 4-0. But Hoban's strength goes further than 4-0. Coming in, the Argents had won 81 straight league meets. That translates to five straight league titles, five straight district titles. Somewhere in there was a fifth-place finish in the state meet, too. The Argents are coached by athletic director Jim Higgins, as they have been from the beginning. Against a team like Coughlin, where they're heavily favored, Hoban will swim an altered lineup. For instance, in this event, the 200-yard freestyle, Gerard Ott in the near lane and Jim Chopak up top will swim, even though Ott's a breaststroker and Chopak's a backstroker. In fact, Chopak was the sixth in the district finish last year in backstroke, but they swim this event today. The reasoning is that it keeps them on their toes in practice, and it's good for their overall conditioning. Chopak, by the way, won in a time of 2.07. Speaking of conditioning, that breaks down to practice every morning from 6.45 to 9, and then weight training every day after school. Hoban was favored to win, and they didn't disappoint the fans. They win their 82nd straight in the league, 126-38. It was a big win, too, believe it or not. Their 100th since the team started. Next Tuesday, Hoban will be at Nanny Coke. The Trojans are undefeated, too. A great swimming program at Bishop Hoban High School. Up in Scranton, white-shirted Bishop Hannon hosted West Scranton in the season opener for both teams. Hannon had a tough time finding the range, usually hot number 54 Kathy Cadden having trouble on the first shot, but she did find the rebound and the range for two of her 10 points. West, meanwhile, was getting the inside benefits here, number 23 lowest judge in the lane for an easy two. She had 14 in the game. West liked to run, too. Here's center number 51, Lori Bittenbender, driving the length of the floor. Good ball handling for a big girl. Even though she missed the drive, Barbara Davis canned the rebound. 
Lori had better luck with this baseline pass from Barbara. She hits the shot, draws the foul, and turns it into a three-pointer. Hannon would say after the game that West Scranton outshot them and outran them. West wins their season opener 70-57. Hannon is 0-1. Right down to the wire in Scranton in this game between blue-shirted Riverside and Bishop Klonowski. When we arrived, Klonowski held a 52-48 lead with about a minute and change to play. Number two, Lou Alexi, hits the jumper off a fast break for two of his 14 points. Klonowski's lead is just two. Klonowski was spending lots of time at the foul line. Tom Rose gets two for a 54-50 lead with 36 seconds left. Riverside not wasting lots of time bringing the ball up. Number 21, George Carr takes the ball the length of the floor for the powered layup. It's 54-52 with 29 left. Then the teams traded the fouls and foul shot chances. Chris Nealon made one of two. It's a 56-53 lead for Klonowski with nine seconds to play. And even though Riverside was quick to bring the ball up, and even though they quickly converted the missed shot inside, it was too late. Klonowski held on for a 56-55 win. They're 2-1 and one in the Northern Division of the Lackawanna League. Riverside is 1-1. One one. Across town, the purple-shirted ladies of Scranton Prep were putting on a great team basketball show at the West Scranton Gym. They hit from everywhere, and they shot like they meant it. West was getting nice individual efforts, like this drive and score from number 22, Lois Judge, but Prep appeared to have the better team approach. They hit the setup plays off patient passes. Number 35, Lisa Gardier finding number 53, Cecilia Philbin underneath, and Cece finds the range for two. Pressing seemed sort of a waste of time, here, number 11, only a freshman now. Number 11, Paula Kowalczyk gets two of her 27 points the easy way. Great passing to set her up inside. Prep was alert, too. Number 15, Celia Kane, also only a freshman. Celia picks up the loose ball and goes instinctively for the hole and two points. In the end, they were too much for individual heroics from the invaders. Lori Bittenbender on a bank for two, but a bit too late. Scranton Prep goes 2-0 in the league with a 56-39 win over West Scranton. Kings looking cooking in their 1979 debut at home against a highly ranked University of Bridgeport team. The white-shirted Monarchs working the ball in the lane to number 44, Kenny Casey, for two of his 25, the way he likes it best, inside. Bridgeport was 9-2 and two coming into the game, and they like to run. Here, number 33, Jerry Stever gets the loose ball. He goes the distance. He takes the shot while he's being hacked. He makes it a three-pointer. King's getting good production from a young team. Freshman number 24, George Aldrich, looks as good as anybody on the baseline drive. And hustle? Not even Pete Rose could come near this slide by Joe Purcell. King's is a hungry team. But so was Bridgeport, and they stormed into a late lead with feeds like this one from number 24, Gary Churchill, to Alan Bakunas inside. Then with King's leading by only one, Steve Lochnikar is called for non-advance of the ball. On the jump, Bridgeport takes over. They bring the ball up. But when Churchill makes the feed inside, the man walked. It was King's ball with 20 seconds to play. They called a tripping foul in against Bridgeport. Steve Lochnikar, the recipient of the two chances, he hit both for a three-point Kings lead. Bridgeport brought the ball up quickly, perhaps too quickly. Number 34, Kevin O'Neill called on the charge inside. Kings had the ball back and the lead and time on their side. And Dom Scally put the game out of reach with the easy layup. Kings wins its seventh against three losses against the University of Bridgeport, 80 to 77. Wrestling action from Myers High School. In this match, dark-suited Myers in trouble against Dallas Mike Walsh at 134. Mike had Andy Pinter in a near-fall position. It was one of several, and Dallas took five points for a 19-2 superior decision. Myers is ahead 21-8, but the Dallas fans feel the beat. 140-pound match was over in a hurry. Junior Robert Ayat all over Myers, Myrna Abate. Ayat got the pin in 44 seconds, 21-14 Myers. Next matchup was 147, Dallas Sean Cavanaugh against Joe Ellis. Ellis was the district champion last year at 119 and Cavanaugh was a comer. As a junior this year, Sean looking nothing but tough. He gets the pin in three minutes and nine seconds and Myers is suddenly sitting on only a 21-20 lead. But at 157, Scott Asby and Dallas Chip Borton tangled. Actually, both boys were at Dallas High School last year, but Scott wants to play football for Mickey Gorham. Here he does fine in wrestling for coach Bill Hilbert. A major 4.8-0 win. Myers has breathing room at 25-20. Then at 169, John Kissler put the meat out of reach for Myers. He pins Don Hilsop in only 57 seconds. 
A slightly tougher Myers goes on for a 34-26 win over a tough Dallas team. Myers is now 2-0 in the league. Bloomsburg State College has a great wrestling team, in case you didn't know, and they have had one for years. This year's maroon shirted edition held a 6-1 season mark coming into this match against Clemson. The Huskies' only loss coming in was against Cal Poly, a team currently ranked in the top 10 in the country. Bloomsburg has its own rankings. They're rated number 17 in the nation by Amateur Wrestling News and third in the East behind Lehigh and Clarion State. In this match at 134 pounds between senior Carl Poff and Clemson's George Priestin, Poff was off and running in an active match. Poff is one of several Poffs to wrestle and coach at Bloom. He recorded a major win at 11-3. He boosts his season record to 19-3. Bloomsburg led 8-3. They fill Nelson Fieldhouse pretty full for dual meets during the year when school's on, and why not? Coach Roger Sanders isn't happy all the time. He doesn't look very happy right here. But in his seventh year, the Huskies have had winning seasons every year. They win out of seven out of ten meets. His counterpart for this match is Clemson coach Wade Shallis, a national collegiate champ from Clarion who's in training for the 1980 Olympics at 163 pounds. Wade is one of the best-known wrestlers in the country. The Tigers were 3-1 and one coming in. However, they also had four men out with the flu. At 142, Gibbs Johnson had nothing but trouble with Brad Perry. Perry flipped Johnson all over the place. He recorded a 21-7 win for a superior decision and five points. The match score was eight all. But after taking a forfeit at 150, Bloomsburg went up 14-8. And in this match at 158, Bucky McCollum was a bit too much for Brad Gregory. Bucky won five nothing, and Bloomsburg went on to win the match 26-14. They're seven and one on the year. A pleasure to watch. Color the money team green tonight. Bishop Hoban looking real tough in one of the most difficult places to play and win, the Nanny Coke Gym. Trojan coach Syl Bozinski knows his stuff. 24 years, over a dozen Wyoming Valley Conference titles, 490 plus career victories, a state championship, but tonight belonged to the Argents. Tough from the outside, number 33 Billy Thornton hitting two of his 23 in the game. Tough from the inside, number 41 Mickey Banus had 20 tonight. These two came on the third try. Nanny Coke had some nice moments. Number 40, Ed Roman on the jumper in the lane for two. Ed's just a junior. Number 42, Steve Lichkowski was game high with 26 points. He's a terrific garbage man. Good at getting the shot away in heavy traffic. But it all boiled down to a shorter Trojan team playing against a faster and taller Argent team, which appears to be tough in every department. Number 25, Joe Slavosky off the bench on the drive, but he finds the open man. Number 43, Norman John gets the gift too. Hoban runs off with it 80-65. They're now 3-0 in the league. The Trojans are 2-1. Black Bears like it in northeastern Pennsylvania. That is, if you believe Gary Alt of the Game Commission. For the last five years, Gary's made the study of the Black Bear his hobby, his graduate project at Penn State, and now it's his full-time job. The black bear is a concern for the sportsmen in Pennsylvania as well. We haven't had a black bear season in the state for two years. During that time, the Game Commission has been monitoring the bear's behavior to see how strong the population is and to see when there might be enough to begin harvesting them again. Monitoring bears, by the way, is no easy task in Pike, Monroe, Lackawanna, or in Wayne County where Gary works. He's put radio tags on over 250 bears in northeastern Pennsylvania. He can follow them by land with this radio radar kit. In this case, Gary wants to shoot a female in her den with a tranquilizer dart. And he wants to be careful to stay out of her reach. With good reason. Mama didn't waste much time in coming out, and after a dirty look, she bounded off. Gary waited and then went in after a cub, and Mama returned to the rocks. We would find out later that the tranquilizer that Gary used on her didn't work. We'd also find out that calling bears by imitating their cubs did work. The mother came back at a run when Gary faked the cub call, but this attempt to put her out cold fizzled also when the rifle wouldn't fire. Gary was finally able to tranquilize two of the cubs and process them. This little feller weighed 75 pounds with a 15-inch neck. He's a yearling male cub. He could get seven times this weight. Gary estimates that he has as much data on aspects of the black bear's behavior as any group in the world. His preliminary conclusions are that bears have adapted very well to people, They've reproduced well in this four county area, and he thinks there may again soon be a hunting season on black bears. They are an interesting story, the black bear. They'll be a subject on prime time, January 24th at 10 o'clock.
First half championship action in the Anthracite League tonight at the Hazleton Penn State campus. White-shirted Lords against the Wreckers of Weatherly. Weatherly won the first half Class A championship. Lords, the Class AA champs, with a win over the Wreckers. Weatherly started with the outside shots against the zone defense. Number 23, Barry Wargula, hitting two of his 22 to bring the Red Raiders out. Reason, Weatherly wants to get the ball in to number 41, Matt Romberger. Why? That's why. But Lords closed down the inside. They gave away the outside shot and started running with the rebounds. Number double zero, Brian Snyder missing the layup, but Chet Sowell there for the rebound. Sowell playing the good opportunity ball. Here he turns a deflected pass into a basket. Two of his game high 23 points. Sowell had help from number 24, Ed Sheamus, with the foul line jumper. Lords able to get the closer shot. After limiting Romberger to one shot in the first quarter, the Wreckers started to get the ball inside to him. He made good on some chances, but Lords was too tough on their chances. Here's Sowell again on the steal, drive, and jumper, and it was the Red Raiders who won the first half title with a 68-64 win. They are now 14-4 on the year. Weatherly is 13-6. Wrestling action from the Valley West gym. This is the battle of the two undefeated teams. Blue suited Coughlin and Valley West. The Spartans won a share of the Wyoming Valley Conference title last year. Coughlin, a real comer this year, especially in this 112 pound match between Gary Smiga and the Crusaders' Brian Morgan. Valley West was ahead 6-3 at this point, but Morgan pulled the reversal and he pulled out a 5-0 win. Six all in the team match and the dimly lit Crusader fans loved it. At 119 pounds, it was Valley West's turn to cheer. Steve Barber all over John Robinson. Steve turned his man every way but loose. He got the pin and six points for his team in a minute, 22 seconds. 12-6 Valley West, and this basketball fan became more and more convinced that the wrestling draws the really hysterical crowds. Coughlin's turn to crow now. It's 126 pounds, and Mark Popple clearly in control. He puts Tom Wright away in three minutes, 15 seconds, and it's tied to 12 in the team match. Jim Walsh put Coughlin ahead at 132 pounds the tough way. With time running out, Marty Schilling pulled a reversal to tie the match at two all. And it was Walsh's turn to scrap. He managed an escape, and he went on to win 3-2. Coughlin came out on top in the match. They dominated the upper weights and beat Valley West 30 to 18. It was Spart the Spartans' first loss of the year, and Coughlin is looking great. To visit the campus of Wilkes College is to see the history of Wilkes-Barre, a history of architecture in the East, and a history of a school which has risen from humble beginnings. Wilkes College was named after John Wilkes, a member of Parliament and a friend of the American Revolution, and the school was started in 1933, but not as Wilkes College. Back then, it was called Bucknell University Junior College, and it started building its campus in 1937. It was a humble beginning. In those early days, the school was contained totally inside Chase Hall. The president's office and other administrative facilities were on the first floor. All the classrooms and student lounges were upstairs. Needless to say, the school has grown since that day. Wilkes is now a couple of dozen buildings and 23 acres in Wilkesbury. Today, the school offers a wide range of course study, degrees in all academic areas of the humanities, natural sciences, and social sciences, and a six-year program leading toward a degree in family medicine, sponsored by Wilkes and the Hahnemann Medical College of Philadelphia. Architecturally, many of the older buildings were donated to the college after it became a fully accredited four-year institution in 1947. The buildings tell much about a rich Wyoming Valley history and a rich architectural heritage. Frederick Wekeser Hall, for instance, built about 1917 by a famous New York architect, Charles Gilbert, built for Woolworth director Frederick Wekeser. It's an example of chateauesque or French Gothic revival architecture. Kirby Hall, for instance, built in 1873 by Frederick Withers, built for Woolworth founder Fred Kirby. The building is an example of high Victorian Gothic design. McClintock Hall, built in 1863 by Vox and Withers. The building is listed in the National Register of Historic Sites and Landmarks. It's an example of Greek Revival architecture. Wilkes is old buildings. Wilkes has new buildings, too. The Stark Learning Center houses labs, classrooms, and studios. On the roof are the dishes for the television pickups to Hahnemann Hospital. The $7 million structure was donated by Admiral Harold Stark, Chief of Naval Operations during World War II. The Dorothy Dixon Dart Center for the Performing Arts and the adjoining Dart Music Hall, completed in 1965 and 69 respectively, replete with a 500-seat theater and studios and the campus radio station. The Pickering Residence Hall and Cafeteria Complex is as modern as today and dramatically striking. 
Wilkes' athletic history has been dramatic, too, with good and bad news sprinkled throughout the years. Good news? Well, women's sports were a part of the Wilkes way of doing things right since the beginning. Today, the ladies are considered to be one of the area field hockey powers. They consistently turn out good women's basketball teams as well. Bad news? Wilkes men's basketball teams started with the disadvantage of a lack of practice space. In 1948, the Colonels scored an amazingly only three points in a game against Kings. Good news? Wilkes built one of the best facilities of its time in 1950 and 51, the Wilkes Gym, home of many of the Valley's varied athletic indoor sports for years. Bad news? Temple's Bill Milkley took advantage of the new building to set a new NCAA single game scoring record of 73 points in the last game of 1951. That's not a record anymore, but the 54 straight points he scored during that game are still an all-time high. Good news, the Wilkes football team ended its first year under coach George Ralston undefeated and untied. Now they play at Ralston Field, named for the biology teacher, dean of men, athletic director, who coached football and basketball and baseball over the years. The Colonels currently play for coach Roley Schmidt. Under Coach Schmidt, they set and still hold the small college record for consecutive football wins at 32 in a row. Good news, the baseball team is one of the most outstanding in the nation, several conference titles, winning seasons the last nine years in a row. Good news, is there better news than the wrestling team at Wilkes College, a Division I national power under Coach John Reese? It's the wrestling team which packs the house every night and tackles the household names in the world of college wrestling. Bad news? Bad news, after seven seasons and several games, Roger Beard found out, the hard way, that while he was still the basketball coach, he would not be a faculty member after this school year. And what about the timing of the release, Roger? You're talking about mid-season or early in the season, this thing comes down. What has that done to the players and the team's morale? It hasn't helped too much because they didn't really know what uh, the story was because they got you know uh, bits and pieces uh, through different uh, uh, methods. But, uh, of course, they were concerned about me, uh, you know, what my status would be. But I knew about this uh, earlier. Uh, I was the first one to know about it, and it was sort of like uh, uh, just a mistake that I, I did find out. So it wasn't, uh, you know, at December 15th when I knew. I knew this beforehand. So I was going to handle it, you know, in a different way. I wasn't really that concerned about it because uh, when you have the facts, you can see how the school can justify what they're doing. It's, uh, as I said, an economic move, and uh, I'm not upset about that. I'm upset about the fact that it did get into the newspaper. Uh, there's no reason for that, you know, uh, and some of the things in the paper were not correct, uh, you know, concerning my future or other people. And uh, I think uh, too many times when it is in print, uh, that's the final word in this area, and uh, I get a little upset with the newspapers because of this. Uh, no one contacted me at all. Uh, this is the first time I've said anything publicly. You know, I, I think Wilkes is a good uh, college. Uh, I enjoyed working for them. Uh, it's not the easiest position. Uh, number one, you're, you're in Division Three basketball, uh, which some people don't realize what you have to go through. Uh, number two, uh, other schools in the area are known for basketball. Uh, King's College, uh, the University of Scranton, Bloomsburg State. So we have a, a pretty tough job just staying where we are. Um, as far as myself, I'm the same coach that was 19 and 6 a couple years ago. Uh, so people uh, in Scranton put in the paper that I'm being fired because uh, we, we started out 1 and 4. That's not true. Uh, this came about before Thanksgiving when we didn't even play a game. And, uh, you know, so I think really it hurt me a little bit mentally. It hurt the players uh, wondering what was going to happen. Uh, basically, it's not a basketball move. It's, a, it's an academic move. And uh, that's why I think, uh, you know, it shouldn't have been in the papers, number one. Uh, that caused some problems because there are a lot of people involved besides myself as far as uh, not being granted tenure. And I, I don't think the true meaning of tenure is being used here either. Uh, you're not being granted tenure on your ability. You're being uh, granted tenure according to economics. Kings was a complete treat tonight against Blue Shirt at Elizabethtown. Hustle, you betcha. Somebody got a piece of that Jimmy Shea shot, but Jimmy's hot, and he gets the ball back to Dom Scaller, who's fouled taking the shot. Beating defensive pressure, you betcha. Here the Kings guards beat the press, and they find number 24, George Aldrich. He hits the driving bank for two. Were they playing a good team? You betcha they were. Elizabethtown was unbeaten in the Southern Division of the MAC coming in. Number 14, Doug Brown led all scorers with 27 points. Elizabethtown also playing without Nanny Coke's Gary Verizon, who has a shoulder separation. 
What about King's Nanny Coke products? Kenny Casey, playing well? You betcha. These two in the lane were two of 25. Ed Donahue satisfied? Not this century. Pacing like a caged lion. You'd never believe Kings was up eight at this point. Can Kings blow the game open? You betcha. The next five plays happened in a row. Are the crowds growing? You betcha they are, and they love it. And Kings wins 86-71, and they're 9-3 and 5-0 and and oh in the MAC. Way up in Wayne County, the team to watch these days is the white-shirted Hornet crowd from Honesdale High. 5-0 and in the Wayne League coming in 19-1 and when they met Delaware Valley in Honesdale tonight. The Warriors a somewhat less impressive 2-14 and at game time. This game was for Honesdale to wrap up the first half championship for Coach Tom Finan. They didn't disappoint. They went inside to number 34 Jim Tooman. The first two put the Hornets ahead for good. Honesdale likes to press and play the tight defense and get the easy shots. Number 12, Ned Sandercock demonstrates and is fouled and makes it a three-point play. Delaware Valley stays outside most of the time. Number 25, Corey Studsrud on the foul line jumper for two points. The Honesdale Press will impress you unless you're an opponent and you may be depressed instead. Tim Wood on the steal and score. They also like the long-range heroics Honesdale does. Number 10, Andy box the floor-length pass to Tooman for two of his 27 in the game. And Andy liked the close in action himself. Here on the drive and shot while being hacked. This was a three pointer too. Honesdale had too much in this game for Delaware Valley. The Hornets win at 106 to 50. They are 20 and one on the year. They're also the first half champions in the Wayne League. Here's a sports quiz. Question A, can you learn a sport after childhood and expect to be a winning competitor? Question B, can you be competitive in any sport after 40? Most people would probably answer no to those two questions, but apparently nobody ever asked tennis champion Lorraine Sharp of Freeland, or maybe she was too busy practicing to listen. You see, Lorraine fits into both of these categories. She tried tennis for the first time at age 20, strictly for interest. She played her first tournament at age 27. Today, she's one of the top 10 in the nation for women 45 and older. I think you have to be in good condition because they're all in good condition, and also I think you have to play very consistent tennis uh, because they all know what the game is about, have been playing for many, many years, and it's consistency and conditioning. What's led to your success? You didn't even play when you were a kid. Well, I picked up the game a little late, but I loved it from the time that I began to play it, and I just practically lived on the tennis court, and it's, I, I enjoy it so much. And then when the senior tournaments uh, were available, it just gave me another horizon to, uh, to go after. So I like it from that standpoint for the competition. And Lorraine wants to protect her senior ranking of number six in the country, so she's down in Florida right now practicing for the senior championships, which are coming up next month. Almost every day she plays somewhere. So to answer those two questions, yes, you can learn a sport late and still be great. And yes, there is competitive athletic life at any stage of life, as long as you're fit and sharp, like Lorraine Sharp.
The University of Scranton is a Catholic school with a famous name, a long history, outstanding academic and athletic achievements, and a growing future. The school was founded in Scranton in 1888. Back then it was called St. Thomas College. The Christian Brothers ran it, and the first four students graduated in 1901. In 1923, the school was chartered to confer bachelor's and master's degrees, and in 1938, the school changed its name to the University of Scranton. It really is a Scranton University. The school contributes numerous college graduates to the Scranton area. Today, more than half the doctors, attorneys, accountants, dentists, and male high school teachers in the area are graduates. In 1941, the Scranton family donated an estate of 21 acres to the university, and the U had a campus to grow into and a new home for the new spiritual leaders, because a year later the Society of Jesus assumed ownership and control of the school. Scranton is one of 28 Jesuit colleges in the country. In 1943, women started to attend classes, nights only back then, but they were able to receive degrees and be fully educated. They started going to day classes in 1972. 1956 saw the university move up to its campus from Wyoming Avenue, and then the school really began to grow. In the 12 years to 1968, the university constructed St. Thomas Hall, that's the center of administrative offices and non-science classrooms, Loyola Hall, home of all natural science and psychology departments, 10 student dormitories, home of 1,100 of the Scranton students, and the student hall, home of many of the relaxing Scranton students. Today, the college is able to offer degree programs in all areas of the natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities, as well as graduate programs in 17 major areas. And the campus continues to change. For years, the university has asked Scranton City Council for permission to change Linden Street into something which might more closely resemble a campus commons, somewhere for students to gather and relax and talk outside without automobile traffic. Late last year, council finally voted the resolution, and now campus commons will be a reality as soon as the U takes care of parking for disenfranchised commuters and after they put in some traffic signals and other stipulations. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Sports-wise, the John Long Center at the university is the focal point of athletic activity, and the sports history at the university is long and colorful and outstanding. In this area approaches the craziness which accompanies the rock and roll royal basketball team and their fans, the team which hasn't lost at home in over two years. But the outstanding record of the Royals and Coach Bob Besswar in basketball is just a part of this picture of outstanding Scranton sports. Women's tennis under Donna Zimmerman, 12 and three last year. They beat Kings and Wilkes, champions of the Northeastern Pennsylvania Women's Intercollegiate Athletic Association. Cross country under John Hopkins, 15 and six last year with wins over Wilkes and Kings. They were fifth in the MAC. Women's basketball, MAC champs last year. This year they're 14 and three. They have won 12 games in a row. They're in the top 10 in the East in scoring and rebounding. Men's basketball under the inimitable, the inscrutable Bob Besswar. The Royals have won 20 or more games the last four years and three MAC titles and a national title and a third place national finish. And there is almost no home court advantage like the Royals enjoy. The rowdy crowd of fans has been compared to a sixth player on the floor. If there can be a shadow over this basketball program, perhaps it comes in academic form. The Royals have continually had academic problems the last couple of years. It's cost them players the last three seasons. This year, in fact, they lost three men. Rather than speculate, we asked Coach Besswar for a frank discussion of the problem. The academic situation at the University of Scranton is a stringent one. It's a difficult school to get in, and uh, the school is fat. By that I mean uh, that we've had a lot of applications to the school, and we have a heck of a lot more applications than we have spots to fill. And we're bulging, and when you are riding on a crest like that, you could be more selective about the student that you take. So for that reason, I'd say that our athletes have suffered a little bit. Uh, we can't take uh, an athlete that is borderline. Uh, we're going to take a quality athlete as well as a quality student. So I would say that uh, in answer to the first part of your second question, that we are taking good uh, academic people into the system. However, there's a, a couple of other things we have to look at. One is the fact that we require that our students uh, have a 2-0 academic rating, quality point average, 2-0, which is a C average. And you might say, well, that's easy, or that shouldn't be too difficult. The school is a fairly difficult school. 
uh, with the Jesuit background here, you know that uh, our classroom work is paramount. It's, it's the main thing. Uh, if a kid has to go to cl uh, class and he has a practice, he goes to class, he misses practice. If he has a lab, he goes to class and he misses practice. And that's the way it should be at our division. However, the 2-0 status is not uh, equitable as far as the NCAA is concerned. NCAA regulations uh, say that a student must have a 1-6 quality point average. That would be a D plus in order to compete. So all we, our school rule uh, is the most important rule as far as we're concerned. And uh, I think that in a lot of other schools, you don't have the same problem because they follow the NCAA rule, which is a 1-6, and ours is a 2-0. And you say, well, four points, four decimal point difference, uh, what difference does it make? It makes a heck of a lot of difference. A kid could get an F and still continue to play, whereas at Scranton, he couldn't. That, I think, is the main reason why we've been having some problems. There's also a syndrome that's running through uh, a, a, a little stream that's running through in, in our system, and I, I haven't been able to put my finger on it. Usually, freshmen and sophomores have difficulty in a new school situation, uh, the transition process from high school into a college. But we haven't had problems with freshmen and sophomores. Uh, we've had problems with juniors and seniors. And uh, this is unique. Usually by the time a youngster reaches his junior and senior year, he feels free in the situation. He knows the teachers. He's, uh, he's fairly familiar with the academic situation here at a school. But w we have lost upperclassmen rather than underclassmen. I don't know the reason yet. It might be because I don't place enough emphasis on my juniors and seniors. I really work hard with the freshmen and sophomores to get them over the hump, so to speak. But the juniors and seniors, I, I leave alone for a number of reasons. One, because they don't want me on their back all the time. They're 20 and 21 and 22 years old, and they know what's going on, and they feel that they can handle it. And I want to give them that freedom. However, uh, what's happened in our situation is that our juniors and seniors haven't been able to, to handle it. So in order to cope with it, uh, I've started to tighten the strings on my juniors and seniors as well. Now you might say I'm closing the barn door you know, after the horses are gone, and some of the horses are gone. So, uh, but again, uh, for the kids coming in, I, I have tightened up. And it might have been my situation. It might be the 2-0. Uh, I'm studying it. I haven't come up with any, any really cogent reasons for it. If you were looking for a single reason for Honesdale High School's basketball success over the last three years, you could look to their coach, Tom Finan. He's led the team to two straight Wayne League titles. You could look to the Hornets' press, which drives opponents to distraction and piles up points. Or you could look to one player, number 34, Jim Tooman. The 6'6 pivot man is a leader on the court and in the classroom. He's one of the best-looking pieces of high school talent around. In class, he's very impressive. Number three in a class of 250. Early decision acceptance at Princeton, admitted to Yale and Penn, an appointment to Annapolis. On the floor, he's equally impressive. The three-year senior starter has led Honesdale to an 87-10 record in those three years, and this season is far from over. The Hornets are 20-1. Their only loss came as Jim sat injured on the bench. He averages over 28 points and nearly 16 rebounds a game in the league, as well as three blocked shots and four assists. He'll probably end the season as the all-time scorer in the Wayne League. Coach Finan says that Jim has the hands which let him handle the ball more often than the ordinary big man. Jim does lots of stuff that's not ordinary. He's part of what makes Honesdale High a winner this winter. More than 500 sports fans gathered last night in Hazleton for the 16th annual YMCA Sports Banquet. Guest speaker at the dinner was New York Jets head coach Walt Michaels. A regular feature at the yearly gathering is a presentation of the YMCA Hall of Fame Awards. Named to the 1979 Hall of Fame were Joseph Dudek, a football All-American in North Carolina, Dr. James Falvello, a Temple University football great, and Walter Lazowski, who played football and basketball at Providence College. Also named were Anthony Manfredi, a basketball ref, Jerry Moy, who played basketball at Fordham, Jerry Plantius for his football at Michigan State that took him to the Rose Bowl, Leo Points, a senior bowling champ, and Minnie Smith for golf. And a memorial award was presented to Carson Walski for his early football achievements. The award was accepted by his wife. All of the Hall of Famers began their sports careers in Hazleton, and they were honored for their sports achievements at the Hazleton Y. Mark Albrecht for Eyewitness Sports. The big meeting of the media took place tonight over at the Wilkes-Barre CYC 
and what a ball game it was. The dark-shirted mini dunks of TV 28 took on the Insta buckets of TV 16. The bad guys are in white. Both teams started off strong, but the paste we promised to pound just wasn't smoothing out. The buckets took a 10-point halftime lead to the locker room. The mini dunks had to do something and fast. But don't fear, fans. Luckily, just off the plane from Washington was Father Bob Neno. And with his strong shooting and this last second score from Mark Alinghi, the dunks tied it up unbelievably, and it was overtime, 58-58. But that was about the end of our luck. Joe's boys really poured it on the poor dunks, and when it was all over, the Insta Buckets won it, 58-66. But it was for a good cause, and the fans went home after a great game. Will they meet again is a question. Mark Albrecht for Eyewitness Sports in Wilkes-Barre. The game of the night tonight, you could argue it was this game between White Shirt of Dunmore and Scranton Prep, both unbeaten in the second half of the Southern Division of the Lackawanna League coming in. Dunmore worked the ball for a full minute before number 40, Joe Carlucci, drew first blood on the first shot. You might say Dunmore is a ball control team. You could say that and understate the point. But believe it or not, they are not boring to watch. They execute too well for that. And if you get tired of watching them, well, you could watch Coach Connie Ossianzi pull the strings from the sideline. He really is a sixth player on the Dunmore team. Back to the game. This is the Carlucci second shot, three and a half minutes after the first. Dunmore, 4 nothing. Dunmore holding the ball to keep it away from Prep's scoring machine, number 45, Billy Besswar. This foul shot, Billy's only offensive output of the quarter, 6-3 bucks at the end of one. The plan worked. Bill got off uh, four shots in the first half. This one good, 15-9 Dunmore at intermission. But Prep came out forcing the action, and when Dunmore played along, the game opened up. This shot inside by number 51, Mike Maurer, turned into a three-point play, 18-14 Dunmore. And when Chris Casey converted the rebound and turned it into a three-pointer, Prep was down 22-21, and suddenly the interest was up. Then, with 2.30 to go in the third, Billy B took the ball down and hit the jumper, and Prep was ahead for the first time in the game, 25-24. The quarter ended strong for Prep as Casey converted a pass inside. The Cavaliers by three at the end of three, 27-24. But the Bucks hung tough. And when number 44, Dick Carr, hit the rebound and made it a three-pointer, it was 27 all. They traded baskets until Billy stopped this ball with his leg and then protested the call and then was slapped with the tee. 33-32, Prep after the foul shot. But number 21, Mike Mackerel, hit a nice drive. Was Prep out of trouble, leading 35-32 with 58 seconds to play? Not tonight. Not at Dunmore. The Bucks hit two more free throws, and the Cavaliers turned the ball over on this play, bringing it up. Dunmore's ball with 44 to go, down one. Joe Carlucci's fouled on the rebound of his own shot. He makes both chances. Dunmore by one, 36-35 with 15 left. Prep called time and went to number 45. He missed the first shot, but Prep got the ball back with four more left. Billy's last second shot, off the rim, and the Bucks stuck Prep, 36-35. They win a tough one from the foul line. They are 3-0 in second half play in the Lackawanna lead. Basketball in the elements, in the snow, and in the unfriendly John Long Center at Scranton University. Unfriendly if you're a visiting basketball team. It is especially tough when the purple-shirted Royals have their backs to the wall for making the Mid-Atlantic Conference playoffs. That was the case in this game against the dark-shirted Wilkes Colonels. The Royals came out hungry. And when number 22, Pat Cusick, hit this jumper from the top of the key, it was 13-4 Scranton. But the Royals stormed back with number 51, John Zapko, hitting from outside. Zap here on the jumper. And Kendall McNeil started hitting from everywhere. Kendall is the player Wilkes has gone to in the clutch this year. Tonight, no exception. This drive off the pass from Mike McCary was his fifth straight basket. It made it a one-point Scranton lead with seven and a half to go. Next play down, McCary converted a Joe McCray miss, and Wilkes took the lead for the first time, 23-22. The rest of the half was one great play after another. Both teams hitting the shots. Tom Minio with the lefty jumper. Time running down. On this play, number 35, Earl Crockett with the steal on the vaunted Royal Press. He hits number 44, Mark Roskowski, who converts. Scranton leads 34-33. A couple of great plays later, Mike McCary on a super tip of a McNeil jumper. Wilkes ahead 36-35. The difference in the teams at halftime, Scranton played for the last shot. And number 24, John DeLosa sent the home team to the lockers with this long-range jumper, 41-39 Scranton. 
Second half, not so close. Wilkes got in foul trouble. The Royals converted at the line, and they win 81-73. Word is now that Wilkes will have to win its last two to make the MAC playoffs. A tie favors Scranton, since the Royals have a better common opponent record. But other close games tonight in other parts of the country? Notre Dame, NC State. Action from the Nanticoke Bishop O'Reilly game this afternoon, their third of the season. The dark-shirted Lady Queensman took the first two and the first half title in the Wyoming Valley Conference. Nanticoke led early as usual, 15-10 at the end of the first quarter. Chris Fisher hits from outside. Then on this play, the Lady Trojans throw up a quick press after Chris's shot. They pick off the ball, and Chris Fisher again. And it's 21-10 Nanticoke. O'Reilly bounced back after some quick passes around the horn. Carolyn Lynch fed Cheryl Sedlak inside for two points. Then on O'Reilly's next possession, super quick Ruth Ducey drove the lane and tossed one up, and it's 21-14. But number 24, Bernice Skursky scored 23 in the game and three times in a row for the Trojanettes. This converted rebound is number three, 27-19 Nanticoke. Then the Trojanettes started to collapse in the middle and block off the passes inside, and in the second half, they pulled away. Nanticoke wins at 58-45. They're now 16-3 overall, 4-0 in the second half of the Wyoming Valley League Conference play. The big showdown tonight in girls swimming, three-time defending district champions Abington Heights and Bishop Hoban in the green pattern suits, both teams undefeated coming in. This is the diving competition. Winner on the night was district champion Eileen Woods of Hoban. This forward dive with a half twist was scored at six and a half, five, six and a half. Best finisher for Abington was second place, Debbie Lee. This reverse and tuck was scored at six, six, and six. Most promising, according to who tells you, could be freshman Teresa Murray of Hoban. She studied ballet. Some say it shows in her control. This double somersault scored four and a half across the board. After the diving, Hoban led 56-22. That was coming into the 100-yard butterfly. Abington's Tammy Bailey won in a time of 104.63. Hoban's Stacy Summerfield was second. But if Abington Heights had any chance to get back into it, it had vanished in the 100-yard freestyle. The Lady Argent's Elisa Wysicki led the whole race and brought home the prize in 56.7 seconds. Teammate Kira Wozniak was second and the issue was settled. Well, settled except to see by how much the nationally acclaimed swimming star Sue Heon of Abington would win the 500 freestyle by. She won in five minutes and four seconds, 46 seconds in front of second place. And the Hoban ladies seem to be heir apparent to the district throne. They beat the district champions 117 to 55. They are now 20 and 0 on the year. Wrestling the national caliber way tonight down at Bloomsburg State College, the Huskies in wine-colored suits enjoying one of their finest years ever under Coach Roger Sanders. Bloom was 14-2-1 coming into this match against Westchester State in the blue suits. In the opener, 118, freshman Todd Cummings trailed Tony Stagliano in the second period, but he ultimately righted the wrongs. This takedown at the end made it 10-7 Cummings and 3-0 Bloom. At 126, Hughesville's contribution, freshman Don Reese, not quite so lucky against the Rams' Bob Katz. Don got way behind in the match, and he was just fighting his way back in when the ref hit Katz with the point penalty for stalling. The time was running down, and Don was behind, and he tried something, which didn't work. Another Westchester takedown, a 9-4 Ram win, three all in the team match. All of which set the stage for freshman Scott Wood's varsity debut at 134 against Mike Ramius. An auspicious moment for the freshman as he rolled his man all over the place. This takedown at the end made the score 20 to nine, a major win, 7-3. You may have noticed not only is this team tough, number 12 in the nation, Pennsylvania Conference champs against the likes of Clarion and Slippery Rock, not only are they tough, they're young. Those first three wrestlers were freshmen. So at 142, Bloom wrestled an old timer, sophomore Gibbs Johnson, who no doubt was looking out for the infirmities of old age. In any case, Gibbs didn't waste any time. A pin in 49 seconds, and a 13-3 lead. Not only are they young and tough, they're healthy. And they say they're ready for the Eastern Wrestling League Championships at the end of the month at Pitt. Everybody's raring to go. To prove it, a real old-timer, junior Tony Caravella pounced on Dave Tucker at 150. The end came in four minutes and 15 seconds, 19-3 Huskies. Bucky McCollum of Sunbury wrestled at 158 for Bloom. Bucky's all of a sophomore, and while he almost put Rick Pingator on his back, Buck had to settle for a 21-5 superior win. Bloomsburg State went on to a superior team win in 38-9, their 15th dual meet win of the season.
Here's some first round Class B action from the second annual Northeastern Pennsylvania Pocket Billiard Championship. It's all going on over at Guys and Dolls in Edwardsville. The guy you're watching is Kingston's Bill Emmett. He'll be competing in the Class A Championship action. Class A is the more advanced class in the competition, which draws its 65 contestants from all over TV28's viewing area and as far away as Philadelphia. It's all sponsored by the Wyoming area JCs in conjunction with Guys and Dolls, and the proceeds will go to area charities. The tournament will run every night this week with the finalists shooting on Friday, and they're still accepting registrants for Class A. And the girls can play too. Gina Bartoletti here with last year's second place Class B champ, Greg Stahora. The public's welcome to watch the competition all this week in Edwardsville. Mark Albrecht for Eyewitness Sports.